So let us welcome Professor Anaki. Good morning. Let me first say I'm absolutely delighted that I have the opportunity to be in Taiwan again and that, uh, that so many of you have come to, to discuss the big challenges ahead of us. You know, I've chosen as the title of my talk, Transformations to Achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, because I think that this is the major challenge humanity is facing. And my emphasis on the transformation is because incremental change and slow change will not do it anymore. I, we really need to change the way we live, we have to change the way we produce and consume things in order to face the major challenges that humanity is facing. Now, thank you very much for the introduction. I, I sort of agree with almost everything you said, uh, in particular the need to go away from the what you call brown economy to a more sustainable economy. I think that's a challenge facing not just Taiwan, it's facing much of the world. Even countries, you mentioned Germany in our report on the, on the transformation, uh, uh, even there on the grand transformation, even in Germany there are issues. Uh, Germany is the largest producer of lignite and consumer of lignite in the world, one wouldn't think, besides being uh, you know, really large in renewable energies. So the challenges are everywhere, almost everywhere. We really have to think on how to advance the way forward. But I'm optimistic, and so my talk will be what I would call stylized facts. Economist Condor called it stylized facts. That means what I'm saying is at least approximately correct, but I don't have the time to go into all of the scientific details. So I will basically give you my interpretation of where we stand and what the future will be like. So with, with that caveat, let me just start with, um, with observing that humanity has made a huge progress already. It's not like we are starting from scratch. And so the first slide, let's see, ah, there we go. Um, I, I would just like to show you four great achievements of humanity during the industrial revolution, let us say during the last hundred years. And the number one I would like to highlight is that the life expectancy has doubled. I mean, just think about it. I mean, for that, we needed to improve the health, we needed to improve the diets, we need to improve the sanitation, um, you know, urban living, jobs, I mean, you name it, almost everything that humanity has achieved resulted in increasing life expectancy. Today, in the world, life expectancy is about 72 years or so on average. It was only 35 at the 100 years ago. And Taiwan is at about 80. And we expect that the rest of the world will be 80 in two decades from now. And maybe in Taiwan it will be even 90. Uh, you know, there is in principle no limit. And so I think this is a huge achievement. And if we achieve sustainable development, I think that will be a part of it. The second one that I would like to highlight is that it's not just all positive news. Despite the great successes, we have about 800 million people in the world who go hungry every night. At the same time, a billion is obese. And uh, that means that a billion eats too much. <laughs> and, and almost a billion has too little. So in principle, on average, we are producing enough. So that's a challenge of sustainable development, is how to achieve higher equity in the world and equality. Uh, this is our problem. Um, and um, so, you know, on the way forward, uh, we have to make sure that we bring along those people who were left behind. Just on the food, by the way, we also waste about one third to one quarter, uh, 40%, uh, between one third and 40% of the food that's produced in the world. So, in principle, we don't need all that much land use anymore. All we need is to restructure the system. The next thing I would like to observe. Um, is, uh, in case you're not familiar with that, uh, um, the number of people who die through war and that violence is decreasing. If you listen to the news, you wouldn't believe that, but it's decreasing. And I would argue it's also decreasing because the number of people who work, live in the democratic rule is increasing in the world. About 50% of global population already lives in democracies. And there, think about it, there is almost no example of democracies leading war against each other. That's, that's an interesting thing. Um, but the bad news is the number of people who die through suicide is increasing. It's estimated about 800,000 worldwide. So that's, that's a big challenge for humanity. 
And then the last thing I wanted to, to mention, and I'm, I'm delighted we'll be maybe talking about the mobile phones, is this is a great success story. During the last 30 years, 8 billion mobile phones have been ex uh, existing in the world for 7.7 .7 billion people. That means that almost everybody has a phone. A fantastic, that, this is what we need to do in other areas if you want to achieve sustainability. But there is again bad news. It's not all just good news. Look at this. One billion people in the world do not have access to electricity. So that's how they have to charge their phones. Because they need a phone. Uh, phones are a great leapfrogging technology because they provide banking and many other services that did not exist before. Um, even you know, in the countries where people do not have identification cards, paying the bill for the phone is an evidence that you are a, a good citizen, so to say. So th this is this is the tragedy, I think, that not everybody has electricity, and if you calculate what the cost of this would be, it's enormous. It's probably ten times more than you are paying for your. Uh, for charging your phone, at least 10 times more. So that's the problem, and, uh, and the fact that people do not have access to electricity is a gigantic human challenge. We all have to work in that direction. This is a, a photograph from Nairobi in Kenya. Students, and I see there are many students here, students studying under the street lights because they have no light at home. Uh, so these are real hardships. So part of the sustainable development is to bring along those people who have been left behind. Part of it is environment and planetary system. So it's about the people and the planet Earth, really. Uh, how to harmonize that. That's what it is about. So I wanted to talk about that. And my apologies to the experts, <laughs> Professor Wu, on, on the climate. Uh, I would like to start with the climate chart. Uh, so if you look here, this is the history of the temper, mean global temperature on the Earth during the last 100,000 years, okay? So 100,000 years ago, we were in an interglacial period. On the vertical scale is degrees Celsius, global mean temperature. And as you see, uh, over the next 80,000 years, the climate has cooled over the ice age. That stopped about 20,000 years ago, and we had incredibly rapid warming during the following 10,000 years or so. And then, which is really significant, quite a constant temperature during the last 10,000 years. Very, very constant. So uh, what I wanted to show you is that the difference between the Ice Age and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Holocene, the, the last 10,000 years, is on the order of 6, 7 degrees, not more. Um, and that's exactly what we're talking about in the future if we do not limit the emissions. So it is a huge interference in the planetary processes. Now, I will not go into the details, but uh, humans, uh, homo sapiens, have tried to leave Africa for a long time. We are a migratory species, so we try to move out and conquer new territory. We are territorial animals, if you wish. Um, and um, homo sapiens tried to leave Africa many times, but the real success was during the Holocene, during the last 20,000 years ago. Uh, in Europe and the rest of the Eurasia, uh, Homo sapiens joined uh, our brothers and sisters, Neanderthalers, and have replaced them. They're part of us now. So this is an evolution of humanity as well. The point I would like to make is the following. The Holocene, the last eight or 10,000 years have been exceedingly, Mother Earth has been exceedingly kind to the human species because you can see that the climate was quite constant and not so variable. This explains why we were able to develop agriculture, early civilization. So that's the cradle of humanity. It's the Holocene. Um, and um, the danger now, that's the rest of my talk, is about leaving the Holocene. Uh, so sustainable development is also about making sure that the planet Earth will continue being kind to us rather than going out of this regime. So that's, that's basically the thesis of my talk. Uh, this is the Holocene, just the last, last eight or 10,000 years. You can see how constant is. The temperature didn't vary much more than half a degree, plus or minus. Um, this is what we agreed in 2015 in Paris, right after the SDGs were approved in September at the General Assembly in New York. We had the Paris uh, uh, agreement that, uh, to be honest, also to me, it was quite a surprise how ambitious it was. 
uh, to limit the global temperature increase to less than two degrees and if possible to less than one and a half degrees. But you can see that the world has already warmed by one degree, you can see that at the end, because of the emissions we did since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. That's a sad achievement of the Industrial Revolution. Over one degree global warming, over 400 parts per million concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so we are not very far from Paris. We will reach Paris one way or the other already in two or three decades. The question is what happens afterwards. And what happens afterwards is quite important. Um, these are kind of called amber curves in the IPCC that has been used quite a lot to look which systems are endangered through climate change and global change in general on the planet Earth. Um, but uh, let me highlight only those ones that are already endangered today, as we know. So West Antarctic ice sheet um, has been breaking off. It is, many believe that it's in a high danger of disappearing over the next coming decades. Greenland ice is disappearing at an ever faster rate, much faster than it was predicted either in IPCC and many scientific publications. Arctic summer sea ice has disappeared so much that it's already possible to take the polar, uh, uh, polar, polar uh, shipping routes. In fact, some of the new tankers are designed in such a way that in the reverse there are many icebreakers and forward their normal tankers so they can take the northern passage. Um, the uh, Alpine glaciers, I live in Austria, all glaciers are receding and receding very, very massively so that it's in most of the winters even impossible also to ski nowadays. So this is, uh, you know, it's a big challenge for our economy is how to adjust to this. And the coral reefs are also disappearing uh, also because of the increasing acidification of the oceans. So we are endangering many of the climate systems, and these are the IPCCs, the scientific, uh, these are the, I'm sorry, these are the pathways the scientific community has developed for the IPCC, and you can see that the highest ones are well over 8 degrees, so bigger difference between the glacier and interglacial period that could be most likely a catastrophic future if we all continue consuming coal, for example. And then uh, the, there is a set of scenarios in the Paris range that all require fundamental transformation in our life, in our economies, in our industry, and so on. So that's the challenge ahead of us. And to make it even worse, we are moving in the opposite direction. So the carbon emissions are increasing. As you can see, last year, 2%, um, 2018. By coincidence, 2% is exactly the exponential increase since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So we are not doing any better in reducing the emissions. And this is why I think the coal issue is so central, uh, you know, fossil-based transport, uh, fossil subsidies, all of that is working in the opposite direction. We need to, if you're going to fulfill the climate goals, in particular Paris, we need, but even less ambitious goals, we need, the emissions need to peak next year. Just think about it, how difficult that will be. Peak next year and decline towards zero. I will get to that a little bit later. Uh, so these are some of the, you know, agreements we had that Kyoto had, had almost no impact. Uh, in the long run, still the exponential 2% rate increases, and I hope that will not be the case in the future. So this is the, so to say, this is our challenge. Uh, I like this, this uh, cartoon because it shows that we are putting an ever higher pressure, ever higher pressure on the planetary systems and on the mother Earth. Um, we are leaving the Holocene and we have a collective responsibility that the Anthropocene, the age in the, uh, in the development of the planet and our societies, that we become more responsible toward making sure that the life support systems that the planet provides to us are preserved. I think this is the key. We should not be arrogant enough to think that we can engineer everything. We depend on the services that the planet is offering us. So that's the challenge, and that's, I think, why sustainable development goals are so important. So this is uh, the second beginning. I mentioned before 
the, the Holocene and where we settled down, and that, that, uh, it, that is called Neolithic Revolution, where we developed agriculture and early, early civilizations. The second revolution in human history is the Industrial Revolution. And I would argue it started right here. This is the first steam railway from Stockton to Darlington, built in 1826. Uh, so railways existed before, they were just, you know, horse railways, <laughs> streetcars existed as well. But this is the first real convergence of modern technologies that powered the Industrial Revolution. So it's a convergence to do this. You needed steel industry, you needed coal, you needed a steam engine, you needed railway infrastructure, you needed logistics, how to organize it, later came the textiles, and many activities. So this convergence of various technologies is the powerful motor for the human development, but also produces many problems later on. You know, at the beginning, steam was a way to avoid the fuel, the fuel wood crisis, because in Europe we completely destroyed all of the forests by that time in many parts of Europe. So it was a solution to the environmental problem, but it also generates new environmental problems now of the global nature, because of the carbon dioxide emissions. So I would say that's the beginning. Um, and it was really radical. That change was absolutely radical. It changed the world and it changed our societies, fabric of our societies and so on. But we have now on the forefront other radical innovations that are converging with many other technologies. Now, this is what is called the learning curve or experience curve. Uh, please note it's a double log scale. Uh, so in principle, you know, it's a, it's a curve that uh, declines exponentially. On the vertical scale, you have the unit cost of the technology. In this case, it's dollars per watt peak. These are photovoltaics. And horizontal is the global shipments of photovoltaics. How many have been produced cumulatively? And you can see it's a very stable straight line. Um, we have what we call learning rate here. It's about 20%. That means by doubling the global production of photovoltaics, the prices will fall by 20%. This is exceedingly disruptive. And we have other technologies that are so disruptive because it means that the more we invest, the cheaper the technology becomes, and the more economic opportunities are to replace the old technologies. But they also have many advantages. Photovoltaics do not produce any emissions in operation, only in the production. Uh, so I have high capital cost, but very low operating cost. Now, this is so stable, and this is what my colleague Arno Grubler and I produced over 20 years ago, this graphic. So to, when I gave, gave the lectures to my students, I would say, what do you think, what would be the price in the future if we continue investing in the photovoltaic? So this would be the forecast. Now, surprisingly enough, here is a new curve. This is exactly what happened. So it's not a prediction. It happened because we invested. But it just shows how disruptive these technologies are. So today, the red curve, the trend line, it's actually the yellow dots. The trend line shows you that um, the unit costs in dollars per watt peak decreased by two orders of magnitude. So photovoltaics are 200 times cheaper today. And we have to say, at least partially, thank you, Germany, for having the feed-in tariff when the photovoltaics were very expensive. This is what the German consumers paid for that, but the global industry developed. So today, we are at the level of about less than a, watt, a, watt, a dollar per watt peak. System costs are a little bit higher, but for that 230 gigawatts of photovoltaics had to be built worldwide. And I'm sure that this trend will continue because we are further investing. Taiwan is also investing in photovoltaics, all countries around the world. But look at the counter example, which is nuclear in, in France and in and I don't know about China, it's quite possible that mainland China has decreasing costs, but in the in, 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 in US and, uh, and in France, I'm sorry, this is US and France, the costs have a hockey stick nature. Um, they, uh, they're increasing, and the reason that there are many reasons why they're increasing, but I would say the main reason is that we are not building nuclear power plants. So it's, it's forgetting by not doing. Uh, you know, at my university, the Vienna University of Technology, you cannot start study nuclear engineering. In Germany, there's only one university where you can study nuclear engineering. And 
so there are many reasons, I'm just saying, but economics speak against nuclear. It's becoming ever more expensive because we are also not building no new power plants. So basically, when we look into the future, I think there are two dimensions of our development. One is what we are doing all the time which is incremental improvements, small gradual improvements in technology, reduction of costs, and so on. But there is a second mode of technological change, and I started with that. These are the railways, uh, these are the photovoltaics, mobile phones. These are radical, very disruptive technologies, technologies that can change the world if we have the appropriate social steering, if, if they move in the right direction. Um, and so this is what we need. For the, for, for the next phase of development, for the next revolution. We need disruptive technologies, and that's not easy to do because of incredibly deep uncertainty about technological change and social change. Technologies are part of us. Um, and, but it's also dynamic, it's systemic, that means we have to look at the whole systems. We cannot have partial silo solutions. And I would like to quote the famous Austro-American economist Joseph Schumpeter, who worked quite a lot on economic development. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, a very nice quote illustrating that we need something fundamental new. He said that you can add as many mail coaches as you please, you will never get the railroad by doing so. So by doing mail coaches together, you cannot get Stockton Darlington Railway. This is fundamentally new. And so we need fundamentally new solutions if you are going to achieve sustainable future for all. Uh, and personally, I think there is no plan B. That's the only plan that the world community has. Now, in the past, we did manage to, we, we did manage to um, have a really radical technological change in the, let's say, every five decades or so. So on top you have railways, then flying machines, telecommunication, uh, including mobile phones, of course, individual transport, and then the industrial processes. And you can see that in the past of 50 years, these technologies have changed a lot. But what I would like to point out for the rest of my talk, what's important is the vertical. It's the systemic. How the systems harmonize together? How do they combine? What kind of institutions we need? What kind of legal frameworks and behaviors? And so what will happen by 2050? We, of course, don't know. That's clear, but let me go back. But I'm putting some examples here, completely hypothetical. But I believe that many of these technologies would combine well, and they're kind of sustainable. On top, you have instead of railways, magnetic levitation trains. You know, Japan is building the new one. Um, then uh, maybe hydrogen pipelines, superconducting. Uh, then hydrogen aircraft. Uh, the new integration between humans and, uh, and the digital world, if you wish, uh, then very, very modular uh, form of sustainable transport, and then maybe machines that make machines. That's part of the digitalization. So uh, we will definitely see radical change. The, it is up to us to make sure that it goes in the sustainable di uh, the, the direction. And this is why I think that the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, are a great, great gift of humanity. Um, they are holistic. This is why I like this picture. It's not so orderly like the UN picture. You can see their goals are lying around. I think, in my view, that illustrates that they're all related. You, you cannot subdivide them. Uh, it's an aspirational agenda. It more or less tells us what we need to do but it doesn't tell us how we need to do it. And, for, and most importantly, it doesn't have strong science behind it. I mean, climate does, energy does, but there are many of the goals that are aspirational for which we need to develop the science. So I would argue that they're holistic, uh, that there is no plan B. This is why we need to work in that direction as a global community. But at the same time, I think we, in particular universities, have to provide science for how to achieve them at the national level, at the local level, at the, in the villages, and so on. And this is why we started the initiative called the World in 2050, that I will now, in the remaining of my talk, say a few words about it. But let me just first convince you that the goals are integrative by giving you a related example. Uh, what you see here on the vertical scale is the global economic output, um, you know, GDP of the world. It's about 100 trillion today. And uh, three important energy-related developments. 
Uh, one is improving energy security. I don't need to say that in Taiwan because Taiwan has a huge energy dependence, even higher than Europe in general. And to improve the security through you know, having more flexible, more modular, more renewable energy systems would cost about worldwide about 0.2% or 200 billion per year. Air pollution is perhaps the biggest challenge humanity is facing on the ground. It is estimated that through the indoor air pollution, because people cook with solid fuels, about 4 million people die prematurely every year. And from the regional air pollution, big problems in Taiwan, but you know, so we have to just look at Delhi or Beijing. Although it's improving in Beijing, but Delhi is a real catastrophe. Uh, if you look there, it's about 3 million people who are estimated. So altogether 7 million people. This is one of the larger causes of human death. So air pollution is a key, about 500 billion, and climate in many of the models is on the order of 1 trillion, about 1% of the global GDP. Now, if you put that together, and instead, and, you know, we model, so we have an integrated model where we look at all of those uh, all of those three goals together and try to implement them in a synergetic way together, the cost would be 40% lower. And so our hypothesis is, and I think we have partial proof for it, that applying this to the sustainable development goals would bring similar co-benefits. So doing the goals together makes it more feasible and more policy-oriented. Doing the goals separately, I think, is a dead end. It is what we used to do uh, is return to the past in many ways. Now, the problem here is, so this is um, from the European Joint Research Center that also works on SDGs. The new president of European Community has put the SDGs top on her agenda. So this is all very important. But what I wanted to show you is they have looked at the literature of the relationships among the SDGs that are around and some of the targets in the middle. You will agree that this is a mess. <laughs> It's nobody. I mean, these are just primary relationships, and they're secondary and tertiary. So, you know, I'm just trying to work through the relationships that most of the literature focuses on. I think it's not the way forward. Uh, it's too complicated. Um, so, what we have done in the world in 2050, and, uh, you know, you can download those reports from the website up there. This is the first report on the transformations to achieve the sustainable development that we launched last year, the High Level Political Forum. And um, well, there were two achievements of that report. Number one is we developed initial pathways of all of the 17 SDGs. But one of the problems we had was that colleagues always wanted to you know, build clusters of SDGs to be able to model it a little bit easier. That didn't work out because they're holistic. And so at the end, we designed six transformations that we believe can show that they, if we achieve them, we will be on the way of achieving all of the 17, and we would argue also that um, perhaps there will be sufficient, the six. And um, one of them, the sixth one, is the digital revolution. So I will talk a little bit about that and about the six in the remainder of my talk. I still have about 10, 15 minutes. Um, so I will not go through the details. You can see what they are also in the report, but let me just say that we find that these six, if they're implemented together at the local regional level, that would be the way forward. Now, uh, so the first one, and I will do that just exemplary. This is from our pathways, how to achieve SDGs. Number one, really important, I don't have to say that at universities, is the education, in particular the tertiary education. Tertiary education is the key. We need to develop knowledge societies, and these are our scenarios probably even faster than in the scenarios to achieve the SDGs. The second one is what I already mentioned at the beginning, is the life expectancy, uh, about 70 plus years today, going even beyond the Taiwanese 80 years and Japanese 80 years. Uh, that will be an important part of indicating that we are going in the right direction. The next one, uh, okay, this, I'm sorry, this slide didn't animate properly. Uh, but in any case, the next one would be circular economy, production consumption. That needs to change. I don't need to say that after listening to the introduction about the brown economy and energy and carbon intensive economy. Um, you know, and the model here, in my view, would be a living cell. This is the metaphor that we try to develop in the report. 
because a living cell has a very, very little interaction with the environment around it. It recycles a lot. So our urban areas would need to do the same. Uh, we need to release the pressure from the hinterland of the urban areas that are increasing in the world. Uh, one example is using wood, more sustainable materials, oh. carbon. It's a, a bridge made out of carbon. You know, the aeroplanes are now, both the recent generations are also made out of carbon. Even cars are made out of carbon. I just bought one it's made out of carbon, because I, I think it's somehow symbolic. Um, you can see how light the chassis would be. And there are many other things that are made out of carbon uh, and wood. So circular economy, closing, closing the number of um, waste products we produce, urban mining, this would be all important way forward. Now the next one is decarbonization and energy, uh, that I think is essential everywhere in the world. So let me just briefly introduce you to this topic, uh, the way we have developed it in our report. Today we emit about 40 billion tons of carbon worldwide, unfortunately, as I said before, increasing. To achieve Paris, the emissions need to decline 50% every decade, and IPCC in its report, one and a half degrees, confirmed that. 50% reduction every decade. This is why we call it carbon law, metaphor to more slow semiconductors, but it's just the other one. We don't double, we half. And so that means by 2030, just 10 years away, there should be 20 billion. And then by 2040, 10 billion. And these are energy, and below you see the, the land use, so that also has to go towards zero, but it's not enough. We have a second objective, because we are so late, we probably have to remove carbon from the atmosphere either to carbon capture from biomass, for example, or direct removal from the atmosphere, or what is much easier and what we know how to do, which is afforestation. So this is the second objective. But there is also a third one that's related to the Earth systems. Earth systems remove about half of the carbon that we emit from the atmosphere. That's weakening. There is a strong evidence that the higher the concentrations are, the more this is weakening. So we have a threefold challenge in the climate area. Now, I think the good news is that there are emerging disruptive technologies that can help us do that. This is, looks very radical. These are kites that Google works on for producing, producing ele electricity. There might be other windmills offshore. I understand that Taiwan is building offshore. There might be a next generation of much cheaper offshore facilities. And something that I find very interesting in connection to offshore wind is concrete sphere, spheres that you would lower at the bottom of the ocean which one can store electricity against the pressure of the ocean. So you don't necessarily need big mountains for, for uh, hydro, hydro storage. One can do it on the site where the, there are pilots, spheres have been experimented with. It, it, the technology would most likely work. Uh, and then something with the fossil energy. We cannot completely forget fossils uh, because they're important. This is a new pilot power plant in Texas that uses a very new technology that I was always a fan on. I had a number of master students doing their thesis on this. Uh, it is, you do natural gas and air separation, you use the oxygen to combust natural gas with, um, with oxygen, uh, and the output of that is water vapor and CO2. And the CO2 you can store, and water vapor is not bad in the areas that, that need water. Uh, so this is, Toshiba made this, this turbine, I think we are beginning of that technology. That would be a zero emissions natural gas power plant, which might need to be part of our energy mix in the future. Um, then the next one would be the food and the biosphere. Let me just show you two examples um, that's connected to what I said at the beginning. So these are the refugees uh, in the Sahel region. Um, Syria is not that different. Part of the problem there is also the climate change. It's an enormous drive we have in part of the world that agriculture fails, uh, leads to many young people going to the cities, generates many problems, hunger and so on. This is their food for a week. This is from the pictures of Peter Menzel. You can see only one potable bottle of water, uh, or clearly vegetarian diet. That's on one side. On the other side, a family in Germany. Maybe it's not that different in Taiwan. I, did, I have a picture from Japan, but not from Taiwan. Uh, but you know, might not be all that different if you look at the shops around. This is the food for one week, so it's clear that the family cannot eat it. Notice the demographics, very small number of people because birth rates are going down. 
in the world. And, and so the point is, and, and you know, another point is for Germany, this is all imported water from desert areas. I mean, so we have multiple problems here uh, in the agricultural production. If we can scale the agriculture back, we can return the land to the nature, also to remove carbon from the atmosphere. So these are some of the SDG challenges. Uh, cities and mobility, I don't think I need to say that in Taipei. You can see how much traffic there is. Uh, but the point is that today, over half of the humanity lives in the cities, over half. And by, uh, by let's say, 2070s, 80s, most likely, it will be about 80-90% from almost everybody living in the urban areas. This is the big, big transformation ahead of us, and mobility and many other aspects need to be resolved, but I think the, the good, good aspect of that is that the cities can move faster than the urban areas in terms of structural change. And in that, in that sense, mayors are very important people. We have to get mayors on board of the sustainable development. Now, so you can see this is the likelihood of almost everybody living in the cities, but you know that UK, Taiwan, many of the high industrialized countries are already there with 80% or so, 90% living in the urban areas. This is most likely how the world will look like. The BRICS are also moving in the same direction. So the urban challenge is huge because we have about 1 billion people living in slums. So, you know, we shouldn't think only of planned, organized cities um, like you have here. We also have to think about slums in the developing countries, how to bring those people on board, and how to make the cities more liv livable. That means new communication systems, new transport systems, and so on. So that's basically just a brief overview of our five transformations. And I would like to use the next few minutes um, uh, to talk a little bit about digitalization. So let me start with the mobile phones, since that's how, uh, you know, since I hope you will comment something on the mobile phones. The reason why I said it's a great success story is if you look at the OECD countries, mobile phones have diffused within 30 years. Everybody had a mobile phone at the beginning. Um, in the global south, almost no difference. This is one of the few technologies that let me call it democratic. Because in most other technologies, we have a huge gap between global north and south. Here, the gap has disappeared. It's, it's hugely frogging. Um, it all started with Motorola GSM phone 3200. You know, I was at that time a young researcher, but I really wanted to buy it. You know, in the current money, I've just looked recently, in the current money, it would cost $4,000. So just think how expensive the technology was. I did manage to save and buy one. But then the monthly fees were too high, so I couldn't use it. So I still have the phone at home, uh, hardly ever used. Uh, but uh, the, the point is that not all technologies diffuse like that. This is the sanitation, global north and global south, essentially toilets and canalization systems and so on. That's a hundred year problem, and still two billion people in the world do not have such sanitation. So this means you know, the mobile phone success story needs to be replicated in the other areas. Now, I've indicated that in my talk so far. The big difference is that the mobile phones, photovoltaics, winds, wind technology, bicycles, and so on, electric scooters, are modular and granular technology. And I think one thing that we have learned from the history of technology is that the modular, granular ones can be used much faster. And in the age of digitalization, that might mean that the diffusion speed of new systems might be higher than we have seen since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So that's a possibility. Let me just show you what the potential gains would be. Uh, in the middle are the analog devices. I bet you that some of them, you have some of those at home, uh, unless you have already thrown them away, which is a waste issue. Um, these uh, analog devices from the old analog TV, copper wire telephone, fax machine, and so on, uh, we estimate that they need about 550 watts of energy. Now, long time since the Motorola phone, 30 years later, we have the smartphones and smart tablets that only need 100 of that energy. And they're 100 times more efficient. That means 100 times less emissions with the same energy system. And now imagine if the energy system goes more 
zero carbon or renewable, then we, we could reduce the carbon emissions from that sector almost down to zero. It's a huge opportunity, but we have that in the other sectors too. Um, and then uh, the other issue is that uh, many of these devices need high investment. I mean, mobile phone has almost all of the elements from the Mendeleev table in it, so they need to be recycled. Google is building now robots for recycling uh, the mobile phones. But even the invested energy and CO2 are lower than we have the analog devices, about 25 times lower. So it's a kind of a win-win strategy if we can achieve that in the other sectors of the digitalization. So, but, so digitalization is an opportunity, but it's also a danger for the sustainable development because you can also imagine that through the digital technologies, the consumption would increase enormously if we are not careful. So, it has these two sides, it has two faces. Uh -huh. And um, the, the true power of digitalization, and that's what we discussed in our second report that we launched in New York, in uh, also at the High Level Political Forum last July, it's on the digitalization. Um, and uh, I don't know what we will do the rest, maybe we can discuss that later on, what the next thing would be in the 2050, but the digitalization would also invo involve convergence of many of these technologies. I will not read them, you're all familiar with them, from 3D manufacturing to deep learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, and I think augmented reality is another big issue with the deep fake and many other um, negative phenomena occurring. But augmented reality means that just like mobile phone and internet have changed our lives, this is probably change our, going to change our life really exponentially. Um, so that's, that's the big challenge of the digitalization. And let me show you some potential advantages and disadvantages of digitalization. Now, this is just AI, but if you think about convergence of all of the technologies, it would be even more powerful. So in the short run, the immediate danger, and that's true for all of our industrial societies, is structural unemployment. Now, it's probably true that these technologies will generate new jobs, but they may not be for the same people who have lost their jobs. This is why we need knowledge societies, education, but still, we need safety nets. We need some ways, in particular in democracies, of assuring that people who are left out have still dignity and reasonable life. So this is not so easy uh, to have, you know, safe life and dignity for everybody. Now, what I really worry about is the proliferation of autonomous weapons. There is no telling what would be the result of that. I think nobody knows. Just to give you an anecdote, because I see I still a few more minutes left. There was one company, I will not mention the name, I actually don't even remember it right now. One company that on its board had an AI algorithm, a computer and AI algorithm. And they used this AI member of the board to veto their decisions. And last year, they got rid of it. Uh, and the reason was, not the decisions were bad. The decisions were not so bad from the AI agent. The problem was, is they had the other members of the board had no idea how the decisions were made. And that's the danger of neural networks, that we don't know how these things function. Nobody knows, even people who program it. It's evolutionary uh, algorithm. So that's a big danger. The, the other one is more on the social human side, the legal status. What will be the legal, you know, automobile industry and aircraft industry can sell you vehicles that self-navigate and probably drones will be the next one. I got one from Christmas as a present from my wife. It's incredible how intelligent the thing is or self-articulated. Uh, but what do we do? I mean, some of you may have new cars that can park themselves or like Tesla that can even drive autonomously. If something happens, it's the fault of the owner, not of the manufacturer. These things have not been resolved. But in the long run, we have even bigger issues. Uh, one of them is, what would be our status of humanity in the world that's dominated by artificial systems? Question mark. It's not clear. Because the artificial systems will be taking ever more functions together with us, but that means they're part of us. And uh, the question is, you know, what are our own human intentionality how will it express itself in a system that is composed of artificial uh, systems and so on. And, um, and then the last one, I will not highlight all of them, is consciousness. We cannot exclude the possibility of consciousness and reason emerging out of artificial systems. 
you might call Alan Turing, who is the father of all of this. In 1951, Alan Turing gave a lecture at BBC, and he said in that lecture, once the machines start speaking with each other or communicating with each other, this is where an intelligence might emerge. Well, think about it. I don't know whether he was right or wrong, but you know, we cannot exclude that possibility. And so, in conclusion, our view in the world in 2050 was, um, this is why we started it, if you think that we need a grand transformation, then business as usual is not a possibility. Uh, we need to transform our societies, and the S-curve symbolizes the transformation. As you have seen, there are many agents, NGOs, mayors of cities, um, stakeholders, many groups that are already working in, the, in that direction. So we need to amplify that. It, it has to be a bottom-up process. It cannot be just top down. Uh, achievement of SDGs is the first important step. Even if we don't achieve all of them, if you go in the right direction, that would be very important. Um, then, in the long run, we need to have a vision. SDGs provide that to achieve the real full sustainability. And it might talk something very technical. The biggest thing that we need to do is to transform ourselves. We need new values, new norms, norms, uh, you know. In some sense, it would be nice to have SDGs here on the wall. I don't know if you're allowed to do this, but we, they need to be everywhere. We need to educate ourselves. And so this is why this is a big transformational challenge. So my conclusions would be just the following for today. The, the new, new era in human history might be emerging. Uh, and that is the digital revolution. Uh, second is, uh, this could be a quantum leap for the humanity, but we need to somehow enable the disruptive revolution and provide appropriate social steering for it. Six transformations might be the key for achieving all of the 17 SDGs, and the digital transformation is in some ways most critical because it's already happening and we don't know in which direction it's going to go. For that, we need knowledge societies. We have to educate everybody that they understand what's going on. And uh, new governance is important, because these systems are already testing the absorptive capacity of our society. So that's about it. Only 10 years left. And in my conclusion is, as we leave the Holocene that's green on the left of the graph, I hope that, uh, that, let's call it the digital Anthropocene will be also green and not like it's shown on this graph. So thank you very much.